the necessity for SaaS SEO still exists because you have relevant interests that you care about within your company and that will actually help the user who's evaluating their different options to a grand degree. So you start with what's transactionally most important to your business and then you layer on top of that. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the SaaS SEO So My name is Doris Hasiotis, uh, your host. And I'd like to start by sharing a quick story. So a couple of years ago, before I started Minusia, I was working with uh, some clients, helping them with content. And one of those clients uh, told me one day, you know what, uh, we have this tool and it's called ClearScope. Would you like to give it a try? Like, you know, see how this works. Back then, I didn't know what ClearScope was and I was like, yeah, why not? I will give it a try. So I tried it and I would say uh, that I was hooked by uh, the product. Fast forward a couple of years, I decided to uh, start Minusia. And before uh, starting the, the agency, I thought that it would be important for us, even though you know uh, we had uh, only a handful of clients when we started. And uh, quite frankly, we, we would have to be very selective with the tools that we were using. Uh, I thought that it would be nice to have a tool like ClearScope. So I asked from uh, this client to uh, make an introduction to the co-founder of ClearScope. Um, he made the introduction and uh, I was onboarded. And then, you know, uh, we have started using the tool ever since. Fast forward two more years. Um, and in the meantime, I reached out multiple times to this co-founder uh, of ClearScope. And one very interesting thing is the fact that he was always there for me. Like uh, whenever I sent him an email and I know that he's very bu busy, uh, but he was always there for me. Okay. And so uh, it only made sense for me that uh, when we were about to launch the SaaS SEO, so uh, he would be one of the first guests uh, exactly for this reason. Uh, he's really awesome. Uh, he really knows his stuff. And I'm really excited to be talking to Bernard Huang. Uh, co-founder of ClearScope. Bernard, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me and all of the very kind words that you told in your story. It is really a true pleasure to have customers like you and to really be where we're at. We wouldn't be here if we didn't support our customers and really have them have the amount of success. So generally love just all interactions with all the SEO and ClearScope community. That's great. Um, I would like to start, even though we have many interesting things to discuss today, I would like to start the conversation uh, just by sharing a bit for people who don't know, uh, actually, um, what is ClearScope? Uh, what is the problem that you guys are trying to solve? Um, how does the tool work? Um, and something that's extremely important as well, uh, who uh, would you say can get value out of the product and should go on and use it and try it uh, for their business uh, and who shouldn't use it? So just give us an overview just so we get an idea of what the tool is and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. A great set of questions, if you will. And I guess I'll tell my own little story as to the background of ClearScope, which then should unlock a lot of these answers in a more compelling manner. So like you, I used to be a agency owner practicing search engine optimization. Our agency that my co-founder and I started, it's called Mushi Labs, and we happened to be in Silicon Valley. Now, at the time, you could imagine this is now like 2015, 2016, so five, six years ago. There was a lot of stuff happening within search engine optimization, but primarily to the most like well-known people, it's still the algorithm still depended a lot on backlinks and a high domain authority. And should you have that and proper technical search engine optimization hygiene, 
your website was very likely to rank if you just targeted the right keywords. Now, we started working with a lot of high growth companies on their SEO strategies. And what we started to find was this idea of high domain authority paired with good technical SEO hygiene and target keywords starting to lose weight. You can imagine being in Silicon Valley, we had the pleasure of doing SEO for DoorDash and Compass and Strava.com, all trails, all of these very high domain authority websites where we would look at their hygiene, we lo would look at their site architecture, and we would quickly find that pretty much everything was all good. Yet, some websites just performed like trash. And that became the underlying premise of why ClearScope came to be. So search engine optimization, Google has said over and over again, the goal of Google search is to help as many users find what they need as quickly as possible. And the algorithm up to that point had depended on backlinks as a way to give the algorithm signal that whatever the website that had a lot of backlinks was, was likely to be talking about the subject matter well. I think it was around the introduction of like the idea of rank brain where machine learning was introduced to the algorithm. And that's where things started to really shift more towards this idea of user engagement signal and content quality. So in the past, right, probably computing power was just not as uh, cheap and probably computing itself was not as sophisticated. And you can imagine that using backlinks is a very easy way to process what's likely to be good. But with the introduction of cheaper computing processing and more sophisticated algorithms, Google could actually figure out, okay, if somebody landed on a page, would they find what they need? Or would they go back to the search results and click on another result, perform an additional search? The problem then that we face linking this back to the SEO consulting that we were doing is that when we pointed out the idea that somebody's content experience on a high domain authority website with good technical SEO hygiene was poor, right? Their content experience didn't, isn't likely to meet the needs of the searcher. That was a very subjective assessment, right? We'd say, okay, if you landed on your page for this particular search that you're performing, are you at, would you find what you needed? And then, you know, like people be like, sure, why not? You know, like it says stuff and like whatever. So the need for ClearScope kind of was born out of this idea to say, okay, is there an objective way that we can say, look, the piece of content or the content on this particular page on your website is not good. And where it's not us saying it's not good, it's actually not good because it's not talking about the core concepts that that topic should deserve. So ClearScope then was born to inform people as to what a comprehensive piece of content should look like given any search query that you're interested in writing about. How it works is that you go to ClearScope, you generate a report, and ClearScope goes and scrapes the top 30 ranking search results for a particular search, stuffs it into two different natural language processing libraries, so IBM Watson and Google Cloud natural language processing, to determine what natural language processing is saying are the important concepts. We then take the responses back from the top ranking results and the concepts surrounding them. And then we wrap it into this nice text editor experience that informs the writer whether or not their content is comprehensive as they're writing the piece, but more importantly, offers suggestions on what they should be talking about to make the content more relevant and more likely to meet the needs of the searcher. It's made for, ClearScope's made for SEO managers, content managers, anybody who produces content 
for the purpose of ranking in search. And we generally find that SEO and content managers buy it, but really it's the content creators or the writers themselves who are tasked with using it. So we craft ClearScope not to serve the SEO managers and content managers, but to make the writers have a delightful frictionless experience with the tool and then have the SEO content manager rest assured and have peace of mind that the content that's coming back is high quality and is quality assured. Who shouldn't use it? It's, it's a little bit of a trickier uh, question. I would say that depending on how familiar you are with search engine optimization as a whole, I would say we see a lot of people get run into issues when it comes to using ClearScope for the wrong kinds of search engine optimization uh, related tasks. So you can imagine different searches have different criteria that a user is likely to care about within the topic. A good example would be, right, if somebody was searching for how to surf, we're gonna see a featured snippet come back alongside a video carousel in some of the top results on Google. And we could make the assessment that somebody who's looking for how to surf is likely to care about watching a video much more than reading a text-based piece of content. So we would then say, okay, should you want to rank for how to surf, you should create a video and also within a text Based piece of content that you might create, you should embed a lot of video. And therefore, the impact that text has for that particular search in serving the needs of the searcher is going to be way less impactful. Therefore, ClearScope, the recommendations ClearScope is making because it's a text-based recommendation system, is going to be a lot less impactful as well. I see. So in a nutshell, ClearScope allows you to get an understanding of what's considered relevant uh, based on uh, Google search uh, for a given query and uh, kind of suggests uh, specific terms um, that you should integrate as a con writer uh, inside your piece of content, obviously in a natural and you know, non-spammy way, um, in order uh, you know, to be considered as relevant as possible in the eyes of Google and other uh, search engines, I would say for that matter. Um, and um, I would like to touch a bit on what you mentioned towards the end uh, about, and I, I guess that this has to do with search intent as well, uh, because on some uh, search queries, people may be looking primarily for something more visual like images, or, uh, you know, I'm looking for a video that can show me how to uh, do uh, how to get this uh, specific job done. Um, but would you say uh, in that case that using uh, ClearScope as part of, all, of the whole creation process is a bit redundant or you should do it in a very specific way or even you, know, you should look like the SERP and see that here people expect to see video. So it's better not to create a con piece at all. Yeah. I have a very specific methodology that I recommend as best practice. And oftentimes people don't look at the search engine results page. I highly recommend for any query that you're trying to rank for, you look at the search engine results page and infer the different kinds of intents that the user is likely to care about by just simply looking at the title tags, reading some of the top ranking results. So definitely always start by Googling whatever it is that you want to create content for to rank and take a look at the SERP features, right? These are gonna be featured videos, video carousels, sometimes image carousels or galleries, news, little blocks. Each of these infer different ideas that Google has 
found that, that the user is likely to care about. A good way of thinking about this in terms of a framework is, okay, if a video shows up, then video, video as a block, wherever it is, like the carousel is located, you should treat that as a result, right? So if you see a vi video as a future snippet, clearly video is going to be the most relevant media type for that particular search. Although sometimes you might see a video carousel as like position seven on the page, which indicates that video seems to have some appeal to people, but is not nearly as relevant or important as say, if it were in the number one, two or three spot. So I think that it, you can boil down, you know, if you see a map, it's like, okay, that's a search query that deserves locality, right? Somebody probably cares about something close to them. News is a reflection of a search query deserving freshness or recency in the sense that somebody wants to know what's happening within that topic right now. And you can use these then to your advantage, right? So that's always like number one in my like orientation book is like, look at the SERPs, understand what's happening and why and try to read between the lines of that. And then my step two would be, okay, let's then create standalone pieces of content that could service all of the different perspectives that the user could care about within this topic. So you'll see it when you like look at the SERPs and you're really critically thinking hard about what it is you're trying to do, right? You'll usually see if it's a high level concept, people might want to know what it is, why it matters, how to do it, why they shouldn't do it, right? It really depends on the topic being discussed. And then in this step, I'm gonna map out all of the different perspectives that I see Google surfacing that the user is likely to care about and jotting them down, making sure that I have a holistic view on at least what the search engine believes users care about. From there, then again, it's creating singular standalone pieces of content that specifically address each one of these different intents or topics that the user is going to care about. And that's where I would put in clear scope, right? I would say the best people that we see get the most success out of clear scope are really the ones who are clearly able to identify the most relevant intents or perspectives the user is likely to care about within the topics that they want to rank for. And then from there, if you directionally create the right piece of content, yes, of course, you use ClearScope, but you're, you're likely, your chances of ranking increase by like five to 10x. I see, I see, that's very interesting. And I will come back, I would like to come back on the uh, perspective uh, issue uh, on the search uh, results uh, in a while, but now I would like us to um, shift gears a bit and talk a bit about something that uh, makes me very excited. And I know uh, it's an interesting topic for you as well, which is the future of you know all this, the future of search, the future of con, the future of SEO. So my question, even though it's a bit broad question, is you know where do you see all this thing? Uh, Going. Yeah, I think the most concise way that I can answer your question, and then we'll backtrack from this, is that Google is always seeking to answer the user's question as quickly as possible. So what that entails from a future of content in SEO is a search engine results page that has the highest likelihood of concluding a user's journey. What I mean by that, again, is that somebody performs a search, we'll say it's a high level concept like search engine optimization. What we're seeing then is the SERP has maybe a couple results on the top that just say, okay, what is search engine optimization? But then result number three is gonna say, how to do search engine optimization. Result number four might explain the benefits of search engine optimization. Result number five might explain the future of search engine optimization. So literally the user 
performs the search, says, wow, this entire search engine results page has all of the different perspectives or subtopics that I can care about, and then does not have to perform an additional search, does not have to click into many additional results. So that's what I'm seeing in terms of where the future of content and SEO is heading is into a search engine results page that has a very high likelihood of meeting the needs of the searcher. I see, that's, that's very interesting. I remember I read an article a while back, I think it was uh, by Rand Fiskin. And at some point, um, he, he basically said, if, if I'm not mistaken, that um, uh, on SERP SEO or on, on SERP optimization, let's say, uh, is kind of the thing that you should care uh, about as you know, a search engine optimization professional, let's say, or con creator. Um, and the reason for that is because in many cases nowadays, uh, people get the answer uh, to a specific question, you know, something that they have in mind right there on the, on the SERP. For me, as I see it, I agree with this approach, but as I see it, you know, unless you were talking about uh, some things like feature snippets and things like that, how many things can you do to actually, you know, um, uh, let's say optimize for uh, on SERP, um, you know, aspects and uh, how do you, how do you th feel about that? How um, can uh, con creators, if they can do something, uh, and SEO professionals, uh, do uh, something about getting more real estate, for example, on the SERP, because the SERP nowadays is kind of the end point. You know, people uh, might not even get into, like click uh, a result and get on the page. Yeah, that's a, well, that's, that's a complicated question. And I think one, we have to unbundle the, the idea of what a search engine results page even consists of, right? And there has been multiple studies moving forward where Google has four ads above the fold on their, on their thing, really just pushing organic search results completely away, almost. And or the fact that Google sometimes for certain kinds of queries like movies in 2021 will just actually have all of the movies across the like above the fold because that's right like factual sort of content. So I think there's two parts to this equation. I think that historical or factual content is pretty much dying as a concept, right? If you Google define you know, define any topic or any word, Google has a dictionary that's like, okay, this word means that, right? If you Google, right, movies 2021, Google has all of the movies in a database and those are all of the movies in 2021. So first off, I think that you're seeing then the death of factual and historical content because Google featured snippets or Google knowledge boxes or whatever the carousel thing above the fold is, are just simply answering those particular questions. So that leaves us with, okay, a world where there's very little like real estate because ads are taking up a lot and there's no more room for historical or what is definition factual sort of content because those are, Google can answer with a high degree of confidence using its own algorithms to detect that level of confidence. So really then we're left with not that much playing room for our own content. And that said, we have to be a lot more picky about the content that we choose to produce because I think the idea of SEO cookie cutter content, right? The, you know, everything you need to know about blah, what is blah, define blah, right? Yeah. Those pieces, are losing relevance because they're just really a broad brushstroke that, guess what? The search engine results page is becoming, right? So the idea of a topic cluster is to take all of the different subtopics that the user is likely to care about and present it in one big ultimate guide or skyscraper post. Yet what we see happening is the search engine results page is becoming the topic cluster 
And really what you need to be winning then is the perspectives or subtopics that the user is likely to care about within the core topic being discussed. Really then the best way to win more additional real estate on the search engine results page is to win the compelling subtopics the user is most likely to care about or present interesting perspectives, again, that the user can care about in the future because you're able to offer something unique, right? That's not factual what is definition kind of stuff anymore. Yeah, 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 that's, that's very interesting. And once again, you mentioned perspectives and um, uh, like this, uh, this brings me to my next question, which essentially as, as an agency, uh, very often we create content briefs for our clients. Uh, and obviously we create content briefs for our content creators as well. Uh, but through this process, one of the things that we do is like see the SERP, uh, see what's going on, what is the intent that we are trying to satisfy, if there is a prominent intent. Uh, and so on. And I said this repeatedly for many queries in different industries, pages from different websites, different brands are essentially trying to copy each other, you know? And I, I, I don't know, but this concerns me a bit because I, I feel that we are kind of, all of us in the game of trying to create what Google wants to see um, so that we can be considered as a relevant resource so that we can get you know a result among these top ranking results hopefully and what what what's missing if you ask me from all this content out there is really the soul and as you mentioned like the perspective like where is your personal touch like what you really believe about this topic not what some uh, other uh, website may believe and uh, you know they have created uh, this this guide or whatever. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that because I feel that as as you know uh, content uh, uh, marketing or content creation uh, specifically for a search audience um, you know uh, grows in popularity. I see that uh, more and more results look pretty much the same. Yeah, we've seen I would say the explosion of copycat content and tools like ClearScope you could imagine are part of that problem, right? ClearScope analyzes the top 30 results, gives you conceptual guidance on what you should likely include, and then says, okay, scores you on all of that. And so oftentimes you can imagine that in the hands, ClearScope or any content optimization tool, in the hands of a generalist content creator, you end up with general but more comprehensive copycat content. And that's what we've seen happen. Yet Google is rewarding this idea because they have theoretically a knowledge graph check that evaluates your content quality and says, okay, if you're gonna talk about say a piece of content on the best credit cards and you don't say American Express and Visa, then your piece of content is likely to be bad or complete trash. And conceptually, you could think about that and say, yeah, that makes sense. If credit card, best credit card is mentioned, you could imagine every single piece of content that is likely to be relevant and good will always include Visa, MasterCard and American Express, something like that. So really then, our, our philosophy is that ClearScope saying when we give guidance, you should talk about Visa, American Express, and um, MasterCard, but you should bring your own, your own subject matter expertise to the table, right? We're not saying, okay, use exactly this heading, you know, blah, 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 American Express card. Right? We're saying, look, these are concepts that are closely related to this particular concept, and it's really up to you to decide how you want to use it. Say like another good example might be, all right, we're doing like, you know, things to do in uh, 
San Francisco as a example and Golden Gate Bridge, right? Uh, pretty much everybody will say Golden Gate Bridge is a thing to do in San Francisco, but you could basically take this approach that's like 25 off the beaten path things to do in San Francisco and lead with this idea that's like, if you're visiting the San Francisco, everybody else is gonna say, visit the Golden Gate Bridge and visit Alcatraz, but, you know, that stuff's boring. Let me show you, right, where the good stuff is. And that basically includes, right, all of these different concepts, yet per presents the searcher or user consuming the content with radically different content that is able to possibly serve a need that everybody has because everybody's clicking through and it's like 10 best things to do in san francisco 20 best things to do in san and everybody's saying the same thing right so to like drive up you know click through rates and engagement on your own piece you've able to look at the search engine results page understand that right people are predominantly caring about best top whatever but say okay there is a space where i can slot in or squeeze into the search engine results puzzle by introducing an off the beaten path sort of thing and within that piece of content clearscope is still going to recommend that you talk about the main attractions but you can spin it in a way that says yes these are the main ones but let me show you like the really unique or cool ones so i still think that Right. And this is what we're constantly thinking about is how do we arm the user in to having more of a creative freedom or ability to produce compelling content without literally just saying, oh, this is exactly what the competitor has said in their headings and, you know, copy paste that over. It's like, uh, -uh that's not how we see it but it's like okay a lot of people use clearscope to do exactly that and to be fair a lot of people have found great success doing exactly that because there is still a spot or a few spots or a lot of spots on a search engine results page where bigger longer and more comprehensive is better right so as the world like goes around optimizing their content if you're playing in a very low competition content quality field yeah aggregating all of the stuff into one kind of post and covering it comprehensively but without flavor or soul is actually a winning strategy so it's difficult but that's kind of the state of thing. yeah honestly we we are an agency we, we do it ourselves no i cannot lie uh i would say that as to the why we, we do it, because we care about results, you know. And the truth is, as you mentioned, uh, as you correctly mentioned, this thing works, you know, uh, regardless if, if we like it or not. But if I, if I judge, you know, uh, by, by myself and my uh, experience, for example, with Google search or even in social media, the piece of content that I will always, uh, you know, spend my time on are the ones that have some kind of opinion um, and that feel real you know lessons we learned after we you know failed or did this or that and so on or uh, as you mentioned like things uh, to do uh, because uh, i actually did all these things and i can uh, share with you my experiences or uh, i've tried all these tools uh, and i can share with you um, you know, uh, both the pros and the cons of, of, each, of each tool. But the problem is, and I'm only saying this because as I mentioned previously, we do, very often we do converies for um, clients, but also we have to write as, a, as an agency for different topics, you know, that in many cases we don't have uh, experience uh, and we may be able to pick up very quickly, but we are not you know experts uh, per se so i think that part of the problem is because in many cases the person who is writing the content cannot actually integrate you know opinion because they are not the ones who um, uh, could do that by by default i guess 
Um, and um, yeah, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that because I guess that uh, you know and you like you have many customers and uh, you may know uh, like in, that in many cases uh, the person who is writing the con uh, isn't necessarily the one who knows uh, about what they are talking about. Oh, absolutely. That this is the reason why the state of internet content is mostly garbage, right? You land on any affiliate sort of like website and the playbook for a large majority of these websites has not changed. You buy an expired domain or right, get a domain from scratch and then literally just farm out content to content writers that says, okay, you know, like write the pros and cons of the top 10 vacuum cleaners as an example, right? And like literally in the standard operating process, right? The document that you give to the writer, it's like, okay, go to Amazon and search best vacuum cleaner, or read the reviews and, you know, like summarize, regurgitate what the top reviews are saying about this vacuum cleaner and then filter by like one star reviews and regurgitate what the most negative reviews are saying about these vacuum cleaners and those are going to be the cons and right the user is being tasked with exactly this and it's perfectly okay because they are that's right like either they're abroad or they're they, they just get paid good money to do this and people do it because they get affiliate fees and then you end up landing on these these websites and you're like wow this site is trash right or maybe you don't feel that way but i guess i'm jaded because we see a lot of search engine optimization and we kind of understand the playbook that people tend to have when it comes to that sort of thing and honestly right i warn the the people who have that sort of playbook which is right get a domain juice it with links somehow whether it's black hat gray hat it's rarely white hat but with some kind of mix of stuff and and then they pop and then they drop and i think that's right like how i talk about the seo content life cycle in a webinar that we've done earlier this year but that's kind of they're missing the soul, right? And that's why there's that like eventual like drop in their content because people are clicking into it and Google understands who's a legitimate user because most of us are logged into Google Chrome and all that stuff. And they're like clicking into it and being like, oh, this is terrible. Yet, you know, they'll, there might be a blog post that somebody starts out of passion or a blog that somebody starts out of passion that's just like, hey, you know, here's the five best vacuum cleaners. They don't necessarily even talk about the core ones that everybody else is talking about, but they, they tested them. You could see the, each vacuum cleaner with the person in the blog post. And they're like, yeah, this one's, this one's just the best for, you know, I have a lot of dogs. <laughs> and then they just the best like vacuum cleaner posts, like you'll see like four dogs, like just starts ranking for best vacuum cleaners. And it's because that post had a lot of soul and also because a lot of people who are searching for vacuum cleaners just happen to also want to, you know, like clean up their dog hair or something like that. And so that's, that's kind of like where I'm like, yeah, you need to be infusing your content with perspective, with soul to make the user want to trust what you have to say and content maybe it's one year from now or maybe it's five years from now but content that doesn't have that is not going to like work it's not going to like continue to work it probably will still work for a prolonged period of time because i it's hard to suss out that information right google literally needs to present the searcher with a search engine results page and like test all these different combinations of, okay, what happens if I put, you know, this expert domain expert as rank number one, rather than New York times or some big media website that has a lot of authority. And then they would test that and say, okay, it's like that seemed to be better in these scenarios, but worse in these other scenarios. What happens if we did, you know, 
do this as one, two, and three, and then three, two, and one. So it's always like trying to like suss out, okay, is the user satisfied with what they're finding? So that's to say user engagement signal is really the end all be all of like the future of content in SEO. It's like your content needs to help the user find what they needed for the topic being researched. And Google is going to know that because it has so much data that it's working with. Yeah, yeah, that, that's all very interesting. And thanks for sharing. Uh, I have one last question before we start wrapping things up. And this is, I have this thought lately that SaaS, at least, you know, most categories, and I really believe that it's very difficult to, uh, let's say, uh, start a new category uh, because in most cases it will be kind of a variation of an existing category. It's not going to be a new category per se, but I have this feeling that we are uh, at a point where uh, it may be a bit late for some, uh, let's say, some uh, SaaS companies uh, to even start, initiate uh, an effort around content SEO. Because let's say that you start, uh, I don't know, a new uh, CRM, okay, in the cloud and you feel that this is amazing and it's the best that has ever been and so on and so forth. But let's face it, this is uh, already uh, a very cluttered space, okay, so, and a very competitive one. So my thought is like, at some point, it will, it will be like too late for new businesses uh, in the SaaS industry, let's say, to enter uh, the competition when it comes to content SEO. And I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Do you think that this is a thing or just my, my thoughts? No, no. It, I think the answer or the, the discussion, right, happens to lie upon this concept of what SaaS SEO is supposed to be, right? In a very traditional sense of SaaS SEO, I could see how SEO practitioners are like, yeah, ranking for CRM or ranking for what is CRM, right? I think the evolution of SaaS SEO is mapping the buyer's journey with every step of what the user is likely to care about when researching CRM. So SaaS SEO from a traditional sense would say, okay, well, we need to rank for CRM because that's where all of the search volume lies. I would say modern day like SaaS SEO is then saying, okay, hold on, right? There's different stages of the buyer's journey and let's start with mapping the most relevant intent that we care about as a SaaS, which is probably, you know, our company versus HubSpot or Salesforce, right? Just in the sense that should we get a lot of, say, sales, people are going to ask us, hey, what are your differences between HubSpot and Salesforce? And as a salesperson of the CRM, I could be like, I'm glad you asked. Why don't you check out our resource on CR, our CRM versus Salesforce, right? And just redirect them there. And I think that that's sort of the way to address this problem of, okay, you know, certain topics within SaaS are just completely saturated. It's like completely true, but the, the necessity for SaaS SEO still exists because you have relevant interests that you care about within your company and that will actually help the user who's evaluating their different options to a grand degree. So you start with what's transactionally most important to your business and then you layer on top of that. Okay, at some point, if your business is indeed you know, starting to grow and get more eyeballs, then you start to, well, build more authority on your site, and then you start to be able to compete with the bigger folk, right? The way to rank for a high level topic is not a traditional sense of SEO any longer, right? In the past to rank for CRM, people would say, okay, you need, I don't know, 50 DA 80 or above links <laughs> pointing at your homepage or whatever. The modern day theory of how to rank for CRM 
is, okay, somebody Googles CRM, and we'll just say for the sake of this example, it's Minutia CRM, right, that we want to rank. And it's like Minutia has a CRM. Somebody Googles CRM, and they don't see Minutia CRM, but they were totally expecting to see Minutia CRM. So guess what? They're dissatisfied. What they then do is they go back to Google and, or they click on the second page. They still don't see Minutia. Click on the third page, they see it there and they click on that without clicking on anything else or maybe clicking on a couple of things along the way. Also vice versa, right? Googling it, not seeing on the first page and saying, what? It's not on the first page. Like I wanted Minutia. Then having to go back to Google, reperform the search for CRM Minutia and then seeing what they wanted. Essentially, what we're doing then is we're training Google's model that a page, a front page without minutia for CRM is a bad experience for a percentage of users. Now, you have to increase that percentage. I don't know what it is for different topics, but above a certain threshold, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's 5% of people who Google CRM who don't find minutia who have to reperform a search or click on a second page to then get minutia, then triggers Google into saying, okay, I need to like try minutia on the first page for CRM because tons of people are Googling it and not finding it and having to re-Google, right? In a traditional SEO sense, what people would call this is a navigational search. It's saying, it's like, if you wanted to like find something on Amazon, a lot of people might do Amazon vacuum cleaners or Amazon, whatever the item is. And that's basically training Google to say that that item and this website or brand are like closely linked together. So therefore a page, right, that doesn't have Amazon on it for the particular product item is not great. So that's like the high level theory then of tackling broad topics is that it's more of a brand and like mind share game, which makes a lot of sense, right? And then SEO from a SaaS perspective, you should build from the ground up saying, okay, like we know if somebody's Googling Minutia versus HubSpot, that that's money for us. And you keep working on that and hopefully growing your brand to a like world where a, search engine results page for CRM deserves to have minutia because it's just gotten that much mind share within the topic. Yeah, got that. Uh, by the way, I think that you're like uh, all the few people who call our name uh, correctly. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. Uh, so no, no. before we go, Bernard, um, where people can find more about ClearScope and about you? If you yeah, can share, you uh, can. Yeah. Ping me on, on Twitter. I'm at Bernard J. Huang, which is my full name. Or you can ping ClearScope on Twitter at ClearScope. We're also clearscope.io for our website. That's great. Bernard, thank you very much for this. Of course.